science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower. Evidence is evidence. It's public. Everybody can look at the evidence and assess it, and eventually, if there's enough evidence, come to the same conclusion. For newcomers and old timers alike, the Chloe Sanctuary hopes to give you insight into the health and happiness of your companion parrots. We hope to help you build happy homes using reliable and proven tools. The best homes are built on a rock solid foundation. And the best foundation for a happy home is the bedrock of science. When we stand on the shoulders of giants, the scientists who have worked long and diligently to understand our companions, we can reach new heights of understanding. And understanding is the key to success. I think treated, most of these birds have a good prognosis, and I would say in... What does avian veterinary medicine have to tell us about our feathered friends? How can we prevent illness, see the signs of disease before it's too late? and care for our birds through ill health. What light does behavioral science shed on their nature, needs, and hopes? How can the tools of behavior shaping make our homes happier for us and our companions? Shake. How can we deal with biting, screaming, or other misbehavior? What is it like to live among parrots, let them roam around about you and share a life with them? How much freedom do you give them? What happens if you form a bond of trust with them? Watch and see what understanding their true nature can do for you. Come with us on a journey as we do more than examine a parrot's world. We live in it. Make some popcorn and bring in a few wood blocks. Let everyone have something to chew and a comfortable place to perch. Cockatoot is a presentation of the Chloe Sanctuary for Parrots and Cockatoos a non-profit charity dedicated to the empowerment of captive parrots and public awareness. I'd like to do a big shout out to those people who make this video cast possible. Cockatoo would not be possible without our patrons. Thank you to those of you who make one-time donations. Without these patrons giving us of their hard-earned cash, we couldn't continue doing this podcast. I'd like to urge you to please give us at least a dollar per episode. We do two episodes a month. We'd like to do more, but in order to do that, we have to have the time. And right now, I'm spending a lot of time trying to beat the bushes for the Chloe Sanctuary. It's not easy taking care of birds that are severely damaged, both emotionally and physically. So, please, I urge you, become one of our patrons. And I'm sure that Peaches would thank all of our patrons in person if she got the chance. We try to answer questions from our viewers as we can. If you are a patron, be sure to email us at patron at chloesanctuary.org and your questions will take precedence. We always put our patrons first because they put us first. Hi, and welcome to Cockatoo, Cockatoos with Attitude. Episode 74, three patron questions. 
Are horizontal or vertical cage bars better for my parrot? How to get your bird interested in vegetables? And what do I do when my vet takes a day off? Our questions um, in our episodes... Um, our questions in our episodes are, for the most part, these are all uh, asked by our patrons. They get to choose the questions, and we answer them. Uh, there are a few exceptions where we'll do a, an episode based on something else we come up with, but for the most part, our patrons make those choices. So, so please consider becoming a patron. Uh, we also get together for meetings uh, once a month, and we use a, an application called Zoom which is free to use for you guys. And if you wish, you get to put your own face up there and everybody can see you. It's, it's pretty cool. Or you can just talk and turn off the video. So We also have monthly meetings that talk about what's going on with our sanctuary, and you can get involved in that. We do that on our Slack channel. So we'd sure love to have you join. If you join and become a patron, you get access to Slack. And to our live meetings on Zoom. Right, Peaches? Peaches says, yeah. The thing about Peaches is if you put her up there when we're doing a live meeting, she's going to want to say hello to everybody. Right, Peach? Right, Peaches? You want to sit up here? No. Would you like some more toys? You don't have many over there. Here. You want this piece of wood? I know you have some of those already, but you're chewing them up pretty fast. Whoops. And a few of these. Sorry. And you want a couple of cards? Yeah. You want to play poker? Nah, probably not. So, the first patron question is... Which are better? Vertical or horizontal bars on your cage? Well, uh, first of all, some believe that vertical bars do less damage. Um, oh, by the way, <laughs> these little things, these are called edematics. Um... They drop the volume of squawking by about 20 decibels. And in my case, that's sort of... It's very much like uh, you know closing the barn door after the fox is in with the animals. But, um, yeah, the ringing in the ears is getting pretty bad, so um, I finally decided to start wearing these things most of the time. I also have... Well, every man should have a big set of double Ds. Well... Uh, Double Ds, as in decibel defense. It's just a headset that you put on that pretty much knocks the sound down to about 10 or 20 decibels. You can still hear them. They're loud, aren't you guys? So back to bars. Um, if you have a horizontal bar and the bird starts flapping its wings close to it, it's going to hit every horizontal bar going up and down. It's only going to hit that one little vertical bar. It's, it's not going to hit them quite the same way. Horizontal bars, um, think of it like the bicycles where the kids used to put the cards on the bicycle with a, with a uh, clothespin. Every time one of those bars came by, it was bap, it would make a bapping sound. If it's, if it's vertical, it's going to do less damage. Um, hi, Peach. Most cages have a mixture of one and the other. Uh, some cages, though, will be all horizontal or all vertical. Um, some cages come with a mesh. Right, baby? And there, of course, there are cages that don't have bars at all. They just have plastic sides. Um, as long as those can be cleaned, those are fine. But less chance of any damage if they're hitting a plastic... A plastic... Um, if they're hitting a plexiglass side panel, it's not likely they're going to hurt their feathers at all. Um, now, the thing about horizontal bars is that it's easier for a bird to climb there. Some birds do like the vertical bars, though. Um, for example, on Bob's big cage, he has both, and the one on his door is vertical. So what he'll do is he'll get to the top of the door, and he'll do the fireman's drop. All the way down. And then sometimes they'll do that and squawk and throw his wings out. It's pretty impressive. Um, so some birds like to do that. Well, I'm sorry. I got too close. I'm very sorry, sweetie. I did not mean to hurt you. I did not. I, whoa, what was that? I didn't even get anything on that side. 
We'll have to take a closer look at that side of your head. You shouldn't be squawking there. No. Now, vertical bars are easier to clean because food that hits them will tend to drop down. Where on the horizontal bars, you may have just a pile of food that has... If they're eating wet food, it may make a mess on the, each individual horizontal bar. With a vertical bar, it tends to go down. Um, but a vertical bar makes attaching a heavier perch difficult to do. Um, there's nothing to keep it in place. So, um, for example, if you're using those rope perches, it's hard to cinch them down so much that they don't continually slide down. Um, you have to get a good grip on there. I would suggest a pair of pliers to pull that tight. If you're using vertical bars, um, the horizontal bars, on the other hand, when you hook those things in there, it can't, things tend to stay in place. Bar spacing is important. That's not really part of the question. But, for example, with Chloe, one time she fell from her cage um, in a night fright. And she actually managed to get her wing through and then twisted to the side. So she was in there with her wing stuck, and she was, of course, freaking out. Now, this was one-inch bar spacing, which is what you recommend for most umbrellas, you know, your larger umbrellas. So, um, it took me about five minutes to get her flipped around where I could get that wing out without actually damaging her wing. And considering the pain and fear she had, she didn't even try to nip. Now, here's a bird that hasn't nipped a human being in all the time I've known her, and from everything I've said, I, I've heard, we're talking 37 years of nonviolence in her case. She's a little Gandhi. With humans, with birds, with females that have her own species, she wants them out of her area. Um, uh -huh. She actually doesn't want to hurt them, but she wants them to leave. It's hard to do in a room like this, right? Uh -huh. You will hear Bob screaming from the back room. He has gotten to the point with his prolapse. Um, I don't know whether you understand how birds work, but... Um, in the, in the wild, if a bird is sick, it will tend to get away from the flock, and also the flock would try to push it away. Um, but in this case, Bob, he will sit in a room with me, but he attacks everybody else. And that's strictly uh, because he's physically ill, and he knows it. Um, so you'll hear him crying. Not much I can do about that. Uh, when we get the aviary outside, we're waiting for the actual aviary to show up now that we've made the base. And you can see on YouTube, you can see the whole building of the base. It's, it's, it's done in uh, time-lapse photography, so six minutes is actually 14 hours in that video. But we also plan to do a video where we're going to show the planning, the rationale for everything we've done, and uh, to help others if they're thinking about an outside aviary. Now, uh, with bar spacing, the smaller the cage, um, the more likely the feathers are going to be damaged. Um, and when the bird's moving around, that happened to Coco in a travel cage. Um, we're just going a short 20-minute trip, and she damaged all of her tail feathers. So I had to get a larger travel cage, one where she could spin around, because she's quite active when we're on a trip. Someone like Chloe? Not at all. She sits on the top and watches out the windows. She loves to, to just be a tourist. But not so with Coco. She wants to play in the cage, so... Peaches is an amazing personality. Her daily maintenance requires dedication and mindfulness. She requires two forms of medicine, seven course meals, and effort to entice her to eat. Extensive preening every day, special tools to trim nails, constant attention to her vocalizations, daily walks, and twice yearly checkups due to the possibility of impacted feather follicles and the nature of her spinal injuries. It seems a common misconception among the general public that parrots are like toys in a toy box. Nothing could be further from the truth. They are complex creatures. Recently, scientific studies have shown them to be at least as intelligent as chimpanzees. Every captive parrot needs special humans who will dedicate themselves to understanding them.
those who know their species as it lives in the wild, special people that understand their social, mental, and physical needs. They need to be understood for what they are, and not as merely human companions, as circus performers to bring smiles. Peaches needs all this and more. She is our special girl. Will you help us care for Peaches? Please make a donation today at our website, chloesanctuary.org. That's spelled C-H-L-O-E-S-A-N-C-T-U-A-R-Y dot O-R-G. As a special thank you for your donation, we will joyfully send you a postcard with Peach's happy face. The next question is how to get your bird interested in vegetables. You know, getting them to eat other things is difficult. Unfortunately, they're kind of like humans and that's what they're shown when they're young, that there's good food. They, they'll eat that for their whole life long and it's difficult to make these changes. Right, Peach? And um, so we've got some ideas on how to get them to eat vegetables. Particularly vegetables are good, especially ones that have a lot of fiber, because they have to be able to process that poop out of their system, and the extra fiber for, for them is good for that. Um, hey, no, Peppa, no, Peppa. No, 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 Peppa. <laughs> fingers are now trapped by the Pippa machine. Ouch. Okay. So, some ideas about getting your bird to eat vegetables. Um, so, Try offering them in the morning at sunrise. Um, if you do it right away in the morning and they don't have any food in their cages overnight, which, depending, if, if you're a single person, you might want to leave food in there, because if you die overnight, the birds are not going to do well, all right? But as long as, as, as you've got you know, at least two people in the home, then there's no reason that you couldn't do that. So take the food out, and in the morning, you know, as the sun rises, you offer them good food instead of whatever junk they're used to eating. Um, Just offering them fresh vegetables and a little fruit in the morning um, to get them when they're most hungry. You want to keep the situation fresh, too. You, you don't want to offer them the same things in the same way. Um, you can try chopped, whole, sliced, diced, shredded, mixed, mashed, skewered, whatever. Um, just... Make a variety. Try not to serve it the same way. Try not to give them the same thing the same way. You can also try offering them food and then removing it if they aren't eating it and then offering it to them later. Um, make sure it's fresh, though. Most food does not stay fresh for more than one or two hours. So <laughs> offer them fresh food again later. Um, and then... Don't starve them. Make sure you have a scale, and you double check to make sure they're not losing weight while you're trying to do this. Um, it can cause behavioral problems if they think they don't have any food. So watch for stereotypic behavior, you know, like pacing back and forth in the cage, or grabbing a bar and running their beak back and forth across the bar, or doing something like this with their head. Just repeating the same actions. Watch for that. You don't want them to get into into a neurotic or psychotic state because they're not getting the food they expect. You should also train your bird to be a voyeur. Yeah. Let them watch you and the other birds eat. Um, sometimes just seeing you do it, you know, bird, 
Parrots are smart, so they learn two different ways. They learn through modeling, which is by watching others, and also vicariously, which is, you know, you, you, they watch you burn your hand on the stove, then they go, I'm not going over there, because whatever that is hurts. So they can learn just by watching you, and they can model after what you see you do. And Lorelai's got caught in that trap a few times, haven't you, Lorelai? He's like, what? Huh? She says, huh? Yeah, Lorelai got tricked that way, didn't you? I tricked her into eating a number of different things. The first thing I tricked her into eating was beans. She wasn't interested at all, and now she's just... <laughs> Whenever I cook pinto beans, she's just on it, boy. That's what she wants. It's all right, Pippa. It's all right, little girl. She grabbed my hands and, you know, I'm not Italian, but I still use my hands to talk, kid. Yeah, you, another thing you can do is mix it up. Take them out of their safe spaces, broaden their horizons by taking them to a new room. Um, take them somewhere else. Take them outside, you know, make sure you're in a harness if they're going outside. I don't like birds to be have their wings trimmed, so... Put them in an aviator harness, take them outside, and offer them food out there. Um, for example, Bob would never eat uh, tangerines, but when I took him outside, we have tangerine trees out there. And now he likes tangerines. Um, just the fact that I pulled them off the tree and peeled them for him, that, that started the whole process. So mix it up. Take them out of the space they're used to eating. Put them in, if you've got more than one bird, put them in another bird's cage where there's different food. Uh, the food you want them to eat, try that. Just you know, just as a visit, don't move them around. I'm not saying to replace them with their cages. I think I'm sitting on a piece of wood here. I'm not saying to give them a different cage, but just move them to a different place and have them try it. Feed them in the kitchen. Um, feed them in a back room somewhere. And, um, like that movie back in the 60s, uh, Guess who's coming to dinner? Uh, make your bird your dinner guest. And I know I actually know of one lady who tells me she has a setting for all of her birds. I don't know how many she has, eight or something. And they all sit at their little spot on the table and they get their dinner. Um, you can do that. You can actually make a spot for them where they can come over and eat and you can give them things off your plate. Be sure you haven't put your mouth on anything. We have nasty stuff in our mouths. We have... Um, Saliva, they don't, and they don't need our saliva, so you don't want them to get that. But you can have a little spot on your plate. If you have spaghetti, you can have that sitting over there where they can get to it. And uh, um, I think you should avoid feeding them meat. They don't normally eat that in the wild. So, um, But if you had spaghetti or whatever, you can have them, let them eat the pasta part of it. But that will help to get them to pay attention. Now you're trying to get them to eat the vegetables, so if you give them a little bit of spaghetti with, a, with, with broccoli or cauliflower or some other vegetable, or peas or corn or something, um, that can help them to want to eat it. You know, they're watching you eat it. You, it's on your plate. Works better with birds than it does with kids, I'll tell you that. You want to also make sure that whatever food you're offering them is healthy and doesn't have a ton of salt in it. Uh, so you need to read labels. I think more people are doing that today. Um, and, you know, all this may have a side effect of making, making you eat better, too. Because you're thinking about what's on that plate. Um, pizzas, you're vibrating. I'm just touching your head and you're vibrating. That's not good. Now, top, top the new things that you want them to eat with the old. So put on, if your bird likes the muffins you make for them, and you crumble a little bit of muffin on top of a broccoli, they may just get a bite of that broccoli or that cauliflower or those peas or whatever. And when they do, they'll become interested. So um, that's one way to do it. You're just... You know, just kind of top whatever you want them to eat with a little bit of what they're used to eating. Serving it when they're somewhere where the sun comes through. through a, if you're in the kitchen and the sunlight streams through a window, serve them where the sunlight is. They do see better when there's UV light. Some windows will block that, though. So 
if you have a window, you can open it so that the light comes through the screen. They're going to see that see things better in the UV, so it's going to look better to them. Um, that will make it more appetizing for them. And if you've been normally putting treats into their bowls, stop doing that. Use the treats just for their training. Okay? So if they like sunflower seeds, don't offer those to them. Offer them the veggies that you have. Um, and the other, the other good food, like the good pellets that are supposed to eat, don't offer them treats. Use that for training. Um, and if you train them regularly, and sometimes that... They, the training doesn't always have to be in a session where you have... Uh, you have them in an isolated room with a with a purge, and you know, I, I can train them right in here. If I have my pocket loaded with a little bit of sunflower seeds, I can get Lorelei to come over and and get trained to, to do something right in here. So use those treats. Um, these things are driving me crazy. I'm going to take them out. The second I do that, they'll start yapping. So you know that. You guys going to start yapping now that I took it out? Of course, I can't take it out if I can't find the little case it goes in. And now I can't seem to find the case. Hmm. What did I do with it, Peach? It's not anywhere to be found. Whoop. Hey, hey, be nice. Be nice. You don't always have to attack everybody. All right, we're going to try it without those. Warming the food can also help. Keep in mind, though, that sometimes if they get a lot of warm food, um, they will start exhibiting mating behaviors, so be careful. If, if the, the food shouldn't be any hotter than 108 degrees, and if you get it in the 90-degree range, that's just warm for them. Their body temperature is hotter than ours, so... Um, Warm food's another way to get their attention and get them to eat. So warm up that vegetable stuff for them. And you can be stingy on purpose, too. You can, you can just play up how good it is and, and eat it with relish in front of them, and that can, <laughs> that can definitely wake them up to the desire to eat. Um, you trick them into thinking that you've got something that's really tasty, and maybe that thing is, is peas that you're eating. Um, and then you can try mixing it into their the stuff they like the most, too. That helps. Just mix in some of the new with the old. Um, again, it's like sprinkling it on top or mixing it in with mashed potatoes or whatever. Be sure that while you're making changes to their diet, you should do this anyway. But make sure you take their weight daily. So if they start to lose weight, you know you're they're not getting enough nutrition. And that you're going to have to do something. You may have to go back to feeding them the way they, they like for a few days until their weight gets back up and then, then go back to trying to alter their diet again. Most importantly, don't give up or give in. You know, unless they're losing weight or they're showing stereotypic behavior or showing other signs of stress, uh, don't give in and don't give up. It can take months, weeks, uh, with sugar, it took over a year and a half, didn't it, sugar? She's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Right? You guys are so quiet. Only Pip is the only one causing any trouble. The Pip is the only one who causes any trouble. And if he did, if she did, you caused trouble, didn't you? You did, didn't you? Hmm? Yeah. It is ignorance of Bob's nature that turned Bobaloo into a living gargoyle. Bob's would-be parents made a hasty choice and found themselves in living hell, torn between guilt and frustration. I have seen the joy in Bobaloo's eyes now that he has a new life with me as his companion. To see Bobaloo love and trust again is worth the effort of a lifetime. But, once again, 
Bob is heading toward the pain of separation. My heart nearly broke the day I discovered that he was heading toward a cloacal prolapse, that his life will be cut short. To find love and acceptance and then have it stolen away from you by failing health is too much to bear. We can slow the progress of his failing health, but we can't stop it. He will need several surgeries, and eventually, Babalu will die. We want to give him the best possible life until that day. His surgeries will become progressively more expensive over time. Won't you please lend Babalu a hand and donate to his medical fund today? Our donation button is on our webpage at www.chloesanctuary.org. Just be sure to say, for Bob, in the notes when you donate. What to do when your avian vet is nowhere to be found. Your avian vet takes off on the weekends, most of them do. Uh, maybe they work a Saturday, but the rest of the weekend is they're unavailable. It's a holiday. Uh, your avian vet takes off on a vacation. What are you going to do if you have this kind of a crisis? What are you going to do if if, if you, your bird hurts itself and it's you know, it's bleeding and it looks like it's pulled its nail off of one of its feet? Well, the first thing you need to do, um, I would suggest watching two of our videos. There's episode 26, which is What If, Dealing with Crisis. Um, that can be helpful for you. Also, uh, episode 17, How to Do a Home Exam for Your Parrot. Um, you need to be doing those regularly, and sometimes that will help, uh, especially if you do that home exam extra detailed on a Friday morning to look for any problems that may be possibly springing up because you find it on a Friday morning, you might be, you should be able to, you should be able to get an emergency appointment, get your bird in before the weekend. Um, it's going to be necessary to have an idea of how to do a home exam anyway and get used to looking at your bird. Um, hey, you. No, you're not going down there. Where are you going? Peach, what do you want? You want up there? All right. That's what you want. Don't start screaming in my ear, though. You do that sometimes. Please don't. What are you doing? So if you're used to handling your bird and your bird gets into a problem, it's injured itself, um, anything. I knew that was going to happen. Get down from there. I know. Get down. If you're going to start that, you got to have to go back over here. Can't scream in my ear. I'm going deaf as it is, you silly little girl. You're not going to climb on my hand because you won't let go. No. No. I'm not going to. So you want to be able to handle your bird in severe situations. Where there's a problem, you don't want your bird to be frightened by the fact that you're handling it, so you need to get practice. Um, I'd also suggest that you get Dr. Burkett's first aid DVD. You can get that at birdieboutique.com online. I think it's also available from Amazon. But it's Dr. Burkett, that's B-U-R-K-E-T-T. Because if you can't get to your avian vet, you're going to need to know how to do some of this stuff yourself. It's Saturday night and your bird cuts her foot. All right, Sunday morning and sees her a blue and gold macaw. Is sitting on the bottom of the cage looking dazed. So what do you do? The most important thing is to be prepared to make sure that you have <coughs> a first aid medical kit for your birds. You should also have a Saba manual of citizen birds. And be familiar with each of the sections so that if you have a problem, you know right where to go and how to deal with the different issues. Um, you don't want to be having to, to try to look in the... Uh, table of contents or in the index to try to figure out where something is, if you've got a problem, it needs to be fixed now. 
But before all of this, you need to do your homework. You need to check to see if there's an avian vet that has a 24-hour service in, our, in your area. We have one. We have to drive all the way to San Diego. There she goes, right on to old Steve Jobs' head again. I don't know what Steve thinks about you hanging on his head, kid. Uh, if you do have a veterinarian like that, you want to be sure. Uh, door is going to close over there. You go. Um, you want to be sure to put that number on your refrigerator, in your smartphone, uh, or by your landline, by your phone, so that in an emergency you can get to that fast. What are you doing there, Pip? Oh, beautiful song, Peaches. Beautiful song. Very good, Peaches. Beautiful song. That's a beautiful song, Peach. Beautiful song, Peaches. little one here had swallowed lead and had to have uh, let go, ouch um, had to have that lead taken out of her out of her uh, out of her stomach uh, it was before she came here but she's not all there but she sure is cute, aren't you? Yeah, sure, cute. She also had feather destructive behavior. There are a few spots on her body where it doesn't look like the feathers are going to come back in, like right here at the joints, but she's looking good, aren't you, kid? That's episode 14, if you want to look and see how to stop feather destructive behavior. There's actually something that works on 9 out of 10 birds, so... If you've got that problem, check out episode 14... Yeah, first aid kit. The uh, first thing is to get that DVD from Dr. Burkett. Um, he has a list of items that, for your home hospital cage and for the first aid kit. And that's important to have on hand. Um, but I'll give you the, the basics, okay? Um, but do yourself a favor and buy that video. Um, we're not associated with him in any way, shape, or form. It's just... When you see the video, you'll, you'll understand why I recommend it. Um, now, in your medical arsenal, the first thing to have is... One of the most important things to have is a home hospital cage. You can make it out of an aquarium or a small travel cage. Um, it's with the travel cages. It's better if they have the plastic sides, so the bird won't try to climb up. Um, better without a perch. You want them staying on the bottom. Although you've got to get it, keep it clean. So, so you want one that has bars across the bottom, so that they can poop down, and you won't have them walking around in their own feces. That's a good thing, right? Um, you need food and water containers to go in there. Uh, paper tray liner. Um, Best to use something that has no ink on it. So, a heating pad. Uh, you got to make sure that they can't get to it and electrocute themselves. Uh, you need towels and a thermometer so you know what, what temperature that the cage is because it's going to need to be warmer. Um, when a body gets cold, it has to try to heat itself up and that takes a lot of energy and you want them to use that energy to heal rather than using that energy to try to stay warm. So Now, in your first aid kit, you're going to need gauze, cotton-tipped applicators, uh, Q-tips, right? Um, cotton balls, rubbing alcohol. The alcohol is not to put on their skin, okay? 
The rubbing alcohol is to clean items. Like if you have to trim their their feathers or they have a broken feather and you need to trim it, you want to take rubbing alcohol and clean the scissors first. Um, if you have to do anything... Calm down now. Just calm down, baby. If you have any... Uh, let's say if you're using hemostats or something like that, you want to clean them first, okay? Scissors, you want to clean them first. Um... Latex gloves, uh, betadine if, to clean wounds, a bottle of eye wash in case they get something in their eye. That's happened around here. She had this problem just recently. Um, tweezers, a nail file, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is not a disinfectant. You use hydrogen peroxide to get blood off of their feathers, that kind of thing. Or to clean a wound so you can see what's in it. It is not a disinfectant, though, and don't treat it like that. That's not the purpose of hydrogen peroxide. Silvadine for wounds on the skin, that's prescription. You need to get your vet to give you a prescription for silvadine. Um, if they have a, a, a wound on them, you can put the silvadine on there. Um, that's after you've already stopped the bleeding. Uh, and it will help to heal the skin. Their skin's very sensitive. It's only three layers thick. Um, in some places, it's only seven cells deep. So you got to be careful what you put on their skin because you can really hurt them. Um, we use Super Clot, which is like styptic, only it's not powder. It's a liquid. It's also a disinfectant, and it has lidocaine, painkiller in it. So you can't beat it. Uh, super, super Clot, you can get that from almost everywhere. It's got that. I know Amazon, you can buy it. You can buy it at uh, Dr. Burkett's uh, website, Pretty Boutique. Some miscellaneous supplies you need uh, for yourself. You need band-aids. You need a waterless hand cleaner, something to sterilize your hands. Uh, an illuminated magnifying lens. When you've got to look at like something, a speck in the eye or something, it comes in really handy. Um, a headlamp, the kind you can just put on with a strap so that you've got light, so you can work. There's nothing worse than ha having a bird that has an injured part of its body, and you can't see it because you can't get the light right. Okay, you need a writing pad and a pen. Um, yeah, you can take notes on your phone, but usually if you're in a, in a situation where you're trying to, to save their lives, uh, you want to make notes, you want to make notes quickly, and that's the way to do it. Um, make sure you have contact information for your vet and the poison control center. Now, a hospital cage provides the optimal environment for recovery. It's uh, best to have a designated cage for this and have it prepared before you have a problem, okay? You don't want to be scrambling to put together a, a hospital cage, which has to be temperature controlled and, you know, and clean. And you want to get all that done ahead of time, uh, have it ready for an emergency. And as I said before, a smooth side to the best. That way the bird will sit at the bottom of the cage and not use up its energy. Very good, Salander. Excellent. Big boy. Big boy, Sal. Big boy. No, no, no. You're not going to grab my finger. Uh -uh. Salamander. <laughs> Now, Sal's broken some his tail feathers, and I don't even know where. The cages that he's in, his day and night cage, he shouldn't be busting his feathers. But he has. Not that he can fly, he can't. He has a twisted pelvis, so he's not doing any flying, but... A little winded up there, kid. Big boy. I love you, Salamander. No, you leave her alone. No, Pippa. Pippa. No, Pip. Fish tanks are probably the the uh, the most are probably the best for this situation because you because they're can be relatively sealed to keep heat in. Um, you'll obviously still need air coming from the top. It, 
like a ten gallon for most smaller um, birds, like a Congo African Grey or a Kaiik or whatever. I'd be. If you're talking a larger bird, you may need a thirty gallon. Um, but the main thing is you need a place where they can be, where they don't have to stress themselves. You can keep it warm, and where they're not going to be too active, so that they can get their strength back. But you could use a large dog crate. You could use. A, there are carrying cages. Um, like iCrate makes several carrying cages that have just a base. You know, they're basically just. Beautiful song, Peaches. Beautiful song. Beautiful song, Peach. Beautiful song. Most important thing is that it's easy to it's easy to clean and dis disinfect. Um, you should put the water and food in shallow dishes on the bottom of the hospital uh -huh. cage, so the birds can get to them easy. They need rest and warmth so they can heal. Um, if you can restrict their movement, then you can help them conserve their energy. And um, and by having the food and water right there, it'll encourage them to eat and drink. Now, there's a lot of things that can happen to these guys in their home. They can get attacked by a dog or cat, which is one of the reasons we don't have those kind of things here. Okay. No animals like that. No predators, except for the humans. Um, they can break a wing. They can fracture a leg. They can pull a nail off. They can become egg-bound. Um, they get infections, mainly because they're living with us. Out in the wild, they don't seem to... Ah! It's not common for them to get infections in the wild. Another important thing is that when they're in this cage, they should feel comfortable. So it should be placed somewhere where they're comfortable, and it, they should be comfortable with the cage itself. So it helps to acclimate them to the cage. Every bird that you have should at some point spend a little time in that cage, get treats in there, um, get trained to enjoy that space, because they may have to spend time there. You also don't want a lot of people walking back and forth and dragging their, getting their attention while they're in the, their hospital cage. So uh, you want to put it in a place where they can have some peace. Okay. You don't definitely, you definitely don't want them getting startled frequently while they're in their hospital cage. Now, as far as heating the cage. You can use an electric blanket, but if you really want something that keeps the temperature, that doesn't allow the cage to get too hot or too cold, there's a product called a Snuggle Up Bird Warmer, okay? And this can be attached to the sides of the cage, and it will actually provide heat, and it keeps it thermostatically in the optimum range, okay? It's not so much adjustable, but it keeps it right within an optimum range. So, um... Especially overnight, that's your best bet. You don't want to take a chance, even though you have a thermometer in the, the, the hospital cage. It's best to have something that's ther thermostatically controlled while you're sleeping and the bird's in that cage. So, And if you're using a heating pad or something like that, make sure that it's placed in such a way that you're only heating half the cage. That way... Um, they're not going to get overheated, and they can get away from the heat if they choose. Um, <coughs> there are infrared heaters that you can use as well, but just make sure you don't get anything that's made specifically for reptiles. They have to be made for birds. Reptile infrared heaters can possibly blind your birds, so don't use them. They have to be specifically for birds Avatech makes something like that, and there are others as well. And with it being warm in there, make sure they have enough water. Make sure they're drinking their water, because uh, they'll dry out. You know, when you're in a place that's hot, like in the desert, you're losing your water quickly, and uh, you're sweating it out. And if they get dehydrated, they're not going to get well. What's the ideal temperature? It can vary, but generally it's between 85 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, 
Now, if you have a commercial incubator or something like that, they already have a built-in system to give that heat. Um, they also make hospital cages for birds, but these are quite expensive, and you probably won't want to spend that much money. If you have a, a bunch of birds like we do here, it's, it's well worth spending the extra money to have a professional one. You can make your own. I'm going through the checklist to make sure you have everything under circumstance where your bird is sick. Now, let's say that if you can't, there's no bed available. You, there's just nowhere you can go, and your bird's sitting on the bottom of the cage, and it's obviously stressed, and you're going to do your quick exam, try to figure out what's going on. You're going to look at the poop. You're going to look to see if there's any other signs. Check their eyes, their nares, see if there's any issues there. See if they can if they can stand. If they're you know if you twist your finger a little bit, do they lose their balance more than they normally do? Um, look for any discharges, any discoloration, anything like that. Um, too much urine in the poop. Uh, if they have diarrhea, which would be the broken pieces of feces, that's diarrhea. Having a whole bunch of extra urine is not diarrhea. That's usually a problem with the, uh, the renal shunt, which means that the liver is being bypassed. Um, and that's a dangerous situation. So you keep them warm and keep them in that hospital cage until you can get to, them, to the vet. First thing when the vet opens... And when you can get there, the first thing, even if you have to show up at their door without, with, with, you know, calling on your smartphone as you're heading down there. Uh, I'm coming down with my bird. Uh, you'll find a way to fit him in. You know, that kind of thing. So, so the hospital cage can be used for a lot of things. If your bird has gone through surgery and needs to recover, you know, your vet may suggest that you put him in a hospital cage at night, keep him warm and quiet. Um... It's best not to, to repeat, it's best not to have perches in the cage. You know? They don't need to be sitting on a perch. It's easier to sit on a towel. It means cleaning more frequently. But uh, it doesn't take as much energy for them. If Normally they just lock their feet. Their feet actually lock in position uh, on a perch. But if they're weak, they may have trouble doing that. So your best bet is just to put a a towel in there. Now, if you're heating this cage and the thermometer says it's 90 degrees, and, but you look in and your bird has got their beak open and holding their wings out, that's a sign it's probably too warm for them. So you can drop it down to 85, drop the temperature down a little bit. Double check to make sure your thermometer is working properly, too. That's why I like that uh, snuggle up warmer because it it's going to maintain the right temperature, and it's going to be on only one side of the cage. They can move away from it if they choose. Now, you can give your bird electrolytes. You can buy those from, from Foster and Smith. You can buy that from Birdie Boutique. You can buy it, get them from your vet. Um, some people will give Pedialyte to their birds. There's some other stuff in Pedialyte I don't like, but yeah, it'll work. Just make sure you have a scale. It's important to see if your bird's losing weight because these guys will hide illness. They're good at it. They're prey animals. They're good at hiding illness. So, And last but not least, and I mean there's more. This I, I can't possibly cover the subject to perfectly, but uh, one last note is to talk to them softly. Use comforting words. Whatever your comfort words are, I uh, usually say it's okay. It's all right. Those are the comfort words they're used to hearing. Right, girl? So be comforting to them. Let them know you care. That helps. It does, doesn't it, Pippa? It helps, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, you've been the exciting one today. Just trying to keep... Yes, I know what you want to do. You want to get up on my hand and not release my fingers. I know you. I know. I know what you're going to do. Yeah. Go. So, let's. You want to say goodbye? You want to get on my hand, so I'll let you say goodbye. Peppa, you want to say goodbye to the people? You want to say goodbye to the people? Hey, pip, 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 p
Pippa. A very good girl. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs> okay. I have to... You have to let go of my hand now. Good girl. Right there. i got to turn off these cameras. Okay. You want to scoop? You got to scoot over here. While Dad does this. i got to stand up. Let go of me. <laughs> Cut it out. All right, you two. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Look. I mean, this is ridiculous. What are you doing? I've got two birds hung on me. Come here. Come here. What are you doing? Why don't you sit up here? And you want to sit over there? And you don't need to be stuck to my clothing. Come on. Come on. Come here. Let's go! We welcome your feedback on our videos. We look forward to your insights, tips, questions, stories, and pictures. You can email us at cockatude at chloesanctuary.org, reach us on Twitter at sign Chloe Sanctuary, and join with us on our Facebook Chloe Sanctuary page. To science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the aura of a flower. Yeah, let go. Jeez, let go out. Ah, you are something else. Let go of me. Thank you.